Good afternoon. I am Gregory Washington, the president of George Mason University, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to Russia's war on Ukraine in a historical perspective. Our Russian and Eurasian studies program developed this 12 part series as part of a course Mason faculty are teaching on Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The goal of this series is to present the work of 12 scholars and writers from around the world. Their insights help us to understand the historical relationship between Russia and Ukraine, the invasion itself, and the remarkable resistance of the Ukrainian people. Through the perspective of these historians, we are better able to comprehend the war in Ukraine in a broader context. This series is an illustration of how humanities research in a public research university can create knowledge, spur discussion, and expand understanding of complex global issues. We appreciate your viewership of this series, and we are proud that George Mason University can bring it to you. Enjoy. Well, thank you, uh, President Washington. Uh, thank you everybody for being here. Um, really excited today uh, with the guests that we have. My name is Steve Barnes. I'm a professor of history here at George Mason University and director of our program in Russian and Eurasian studies. Uh, the session today is part of uh, a course that I'm teaching, History 388, Russia's War on Ukraine and Historical Perspective, uh, as we bring together a wide range of scholars to help us use history to better understand the war. Um, so I'm going to largely today uh, do something a little different, which is I'm going to step aside. Um, but I wanted to make a couple of notes first. A special programming note is uh, we have several important speakers joining us today. Uh, instead of just one, which has been our norm. And so we're going to extend our session today to 90 minutes rather than 75. Uh, we completely understand, of course, uh, if any of you must leave early, uh, and we would certainly invite you then back to our YouTube channel uh, to view any portion of the program that you miss. The series is made possible through the support of the program in Russian and Eurasian Studies, the Department of History and Art History, the College of Humanities and Social Sciences, and the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute, all parts of our George Mason University community. We do also wanna make you aware and invite you to our weekly Friday Q&A sessions at 3 p.m. Eastern time, where myself and Professor Cynthia Hooper from the College of the Holy Cross take questions and welcome visitors to enhance our understanding of the consequences of the war. Today though, we're particularly pleased to be collaborating with our good friends just down the road here in Virginia at the University of Mary Washington. So let me introduce Professor Stephen Harris from the University of Mary Washington, whose idea today's session was, and who was instrumental in its organization. Professor Harris is author of the book, Communism on Tomorrow Street, Mass Housing and Everyday Life After Stalin. He's also the co-organizer of the Second World Urbanity Project, and is currently at work on a new book project, Flying Aeroflot, A History of the Soviet Union in the Jet Age. Professor Harris will introduce our very special guests, and he's going to moderate today's session. Please, during the session, use the Q&A function at any time, and we'll try to ask as many of your questions as we can when our guests finish speaking. Uh, and with that, I'll step aside and turn it over to you, Steve. Great. Thank you so much, Steve, uh, for that introduction. And also, thank you just for having organized this really wonderful series, which so many of us uh, and, and students, colleagues, friends, and family have been able to learn so much about what is actually going on um, presently in Ukraine with this terrible war and to do so uh, through a scholarly and historical perspective. Um, as you said, what I will do is I will um, introduce each of our uh, three speakers. They will then, uh, after introducing each one in individually, they will give uh, their presentation. Um, and then um, at the conclusion of that, we're gonna have some questions and hopefully uh, generate some interesting questions and answers uh, in that particular por uh, portion of the program. Um, and so first, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Sophia Diak, 
uh, who is the director of the Center for Urban History in Lviv uh, in Ukraine, which is an institution focusing on research, digital and public history and educational programs. She received uh, her PhD at the Institute of Philosophy and Sociology at the Polish Academy of Sciences in Warsaw. Her research interests include the post-war history of urban cities, heritage and urban planning in socialist, in socialist cities and their legacies. Another area of her work is public history, including curating exhibitions and spatial commemorative projects in urban contexts. Um, and on, on, on a professional note, I also want to say that the Lviv Center is a wonderful location which has um, hosted a, a number of conferences, which many scholars in Ukraine and outside Ukraine, in, including American uh, scholars, have benefited a lot from. So without further ado, I turn the floor over to you, Sophia. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen, so much for this uh, generous introduction and invitation. Thank you, Stephen, for organizing this series and Jessica for being here, enabling it. Um, it is my pleasure and honor to uh, speak um, with you today and in a way make an introduction to um, to my two colleagues, um, uh, We'll talk about specific projects, uh, big initiatives that uh, we undertake at the center. And I will um, share my screen um, in um, preparing some of the, the slides that um, I will hope will situate um, you in, in our conversation, um, which uh, is about um, documenting uh, while being in uh, the war. Uh, please let me, yeah, if everything is working. Yes. Uh, so, um, so then we basically uh, think about um, war in Ukraine. Um, we think about the longer period. We still are um, to be we will be deciding and discussing and interpreting the, the name, of the, the, the frame, the time. We are very much in the middle of it. Um, and with the full um, invasion of uh, Russia, uh, we find ourselves in, um, in mass violence and increasing um, attacks. So at the same time, you know, so many questions are, um, still to be posed, we probably can um, tentatively say that this will be one of the best documented wars. Uh, and these initiatives, we actually see how many very different initiatives are uh, coming together or uh, at the same time. Uh, we hear many comments saying that there needs to be of more coordination, collaboration, cooperation. It seems that is different angles and different uh, perspectives do create a, a huge, um, huge number of different sources. Um, we think about governmental, international, we think about the purpose, we think about prosecution future, journalists are very active, many, many NGOs, and of course, researchers. Um, so in our conversation today, we bring one of the several initiatives of one institution done in cooperation with many uh, researchers and institutions outside. And uh, there is a particularity to these initiatives, and therefore I would like to uh, highlight them and pose some of the questions and some of the reflections rather on what and how we are doing. So. Um, and then we think about uh, documentation in the context of, of the war. So when, where and um, when we document. So here you see the image of the building. Today is another sunny day and another Monday when the third Monday when we have um, again the launched uh, missile attacks of in, on infrastructure and cities. And this is the building that we are working. And it basically did not change from outside. This is the way it looks. Um, 
and inside it did change dramatically. So the image is from February and February 2022. And to the, your right is our conference room, the conference room where we still had one of the one the, the second world vanity conference. Uh, it is again back to the conference purposes, but from February end of February until beginning of August, it was a space of shelter. Um, which actually created uh, a whole different set inside uh, of our institution and our lives. And it's built in sharing stories and documenting, literally for us sharing uh, space. So why did we start documenting? So one was very uh, immediate, it was a reaction. It was not the first day reaction, it was a couple of days after. It was over the weekend that we started talking. What, should, what could we do? And some of the first conversations started in the, not at the working place, but the place where we were gathering, either kitchen or at, the, um, at our cellar during the raids. Um, so it was a very immediate sense of community and the question of what scholarship can do. And especially when we, Natalia will speak about um, oral testimonies, it was a psychological help for people with whom uh, we were talking and also for us speaking to each other. So that's that's a very, um, a question of research and the question of support uh, going very much together. And professionally, it's a coping strategy of who you are as a citizen and who you are as a person, who you are professionally. Um, and in the long term, you know, of course, we were thinking, we started thinking about sources for the future. And this conversation in itself is a privilege because when we think about when the, when we think about documenting, or when you think about reconstruction we, or rebuilding, you know that this conversation starts very quickly um, into the war, but the very fact of having this capacity is testifying that you have ability of doing so. See, um, and this is this is also that one of the threads in our conversations is that coming from previous experience, historical experiences, um, that post-war um, is so much, and even going through the war, and especially after the war, of which we do hope, will be about telling the war stories. And the way we tell the stories, the way how and who has the right to tell the what sources is so much depends which voices, which experiences are recorded, are preserved, are noticed. And this is very um, difficult task because um, sharing this experience and also especially when um, thinking about the dissonant experience, diverse experience, and the very fact of being able to articulate them. So therefore it's a very a question of who is taking uh, and for what purpose testimonies or documentation of other type. Um, it's about legitimizing and asserting uh, the voice, the presence of the certain experiences. So what, when we think about documentation and what you your capacity and one owns capacity of doing, it's very much, matters where you've been before that moment, whether this before moment is before full-scale invasion or before that moment, before 2014. Um, so institutional scaffolding that I'm showing here, it's very much, first of all, and most of all, it's about people, team, colleagues. And at this very, like the first weeks, the last, the last, the last week of February, um, most of the team was in Lviv, and it also shows that Lviv is a place which was not directly on the front line, the place which was not attacked, the place which was a refugee hub, and there was intensity uh, and uh, overwhelmed. Everybody was overwhelmed, but that was a very different situation than in Kharkiv. Or um, let's speak about 
uh, Melitopol or uh, cities which were direct combat um, sites. And Zilviv is a place of refugees. So, so many of colleagues also came from Kyiv and other places. So the notion of team expanded and the place became um, a site of different uh, voices coming together. Uh, so space became important, uh, as you've seen the buildings, so the various spaces where you can feel safe, where you can feel um, with support, the feedback, uh, where one can articulate. And this is really something that becomes very critical when you think about methodology, because this is also something that you test by um, discussing, and this is a peer moment in being in the same place. Uh, and the very fact that at the center we do have multidisciplinary team and the question of our sensitivities, our methodological tools, coming from historians, coming from sociologists, coming people working digital history and media and cultural uh, uh, studies, that all was a way of learning on the go and testing the sensitivity, the appropriateness, capacity um, uh, of what we were thinking about doing. So with what you also come into the massive escalation um, of war and generally into the war, it actually with also previous experiences, they are not the same, but they very much influence what you're going to do and how you can build on. Um, so your one, one's programs, projects, and especially partnerships do matter because these are the people, these are institutions to whom you turn. And we were, as Stephen said, you know, as co-organizing conferences, hosting, uh, scholars doing programs together made us in a very beneficial and again privileged place of reaching out, connecting, contacting, and setting up a network, um, which is was needed um, for for moving forward with things which are very sensitive and uh, very traumatic and with huge responsibility. And it's again, there's also this openness of the two different formats with which we are working and then reaching out and learning from these different formats of um, when you think about research, which is very obvious, archiving, but also to think about audiences when you do intervention in public space or when you do teaching. So thinking about uh, uh, relations with different you know, stakeholders and then you know how that translates also the sensitivity and responsibility and then you know as you see this is a print screen from um, our web page and our research focuses so we did have a focus on wars and recoveries but also public history and plant urbanity which is a lot about planning the future documenting experiences of war is the latest added but again having this angle on the 20th century a lot gives you a background into which to tap and then very practical but hugely important is an infrastructure into which you archive because one thing is documenting but another is archiving and placing it. Our urban media archive was here critical and in a way also highlighting where we could pass, but also as the war is changed, a situation in a moment of change, which is something where we would add. So we never worked with the ego documents, but we are now, and we were not archiving Telegram or social media, and we are doing it now. And then individually, each person who is who is doing documentation brings her or his own experience. Um, and that's a question of how you explore and how you engage and how you how you dwell on your on your personal um, background. So here is a very short note that for me, when I was discussing with my colleagues and thinking for the center, how we think to you know, proceed institutionally, a reference as a historian, and I'm a historian of post-war period, the Ringelblum archive, 
something that I studied as a part of my graduate. <laughs> And something I would never ever imagine would have to be, I would have to relate in a real life. And the same is for my colleague with whom I talked, Bogdan Shumilovich, who entered uh, into diaries and dreams and Charlotte Berand was something you read in your graduate course. And then it resonated. It's about dreams in the Third Reich. So these connections and how we actualize them and individually it's very um it, it it is different but it's very relevant so what we document visual materials diaries and dreams oral testimonies telegram and web documentation i will not speak about the last because we have um curators and leaders of these initiatives we briefly mentioned visual documentation, and this is more than 30,000 images, and visuality is a big um, part of any war, and this war in particular. So finding our angle was something that we discussed a lot, and actually proceeding how to gather images. So one is to work with professional photographers, which was crucial in the first weeks and months of the war, because of in, in March, or the after full scale invasion, because wearing camera was uh, uh, was suspicious, um, and uh, with professional photographers was a question of risk. Uh, that there was less risk. There was people who knew how to do had permission and could do that. And another was open call, an open call for those who could photograph something which for which you don't necessarily have to go outside. So the focus is there on everyday life, the center for urban history. So everyday life, people behaving uh, in, uh, in urban spaces, heritage, infrastructure, and cultural activities. Just sharing some of the images from the, from the call that they are from the call and I show interiors. And these are the images that people were sending uh, themselves. In one case, Irina Sozanska was one of the interviewees who later sent uh, images uh, from her place. Another big topic which came was food. Food is a core element of our daily life in general and it's critically especially important during it's not only about nutrition it's about community survival sharing um and here we do have a mixture of professional photographers uh Irina Sozanska is um a person who was doing an image at home and then the question of what makes a war image it's a very big one. So both of these images are war images, but this one from Odessa, and there is a comment, and living the comment makes it a war image. Uh, the, usually there are more ships and there are more people on a good day uh, in Odessa. Uh, Victoria and Omuk shared an uh, image from her garden. They were attending uh, trees in the spring, but there were alarms. They couldn't hear them, but they were receiving on app. So it's again, you know, what is war image? And then finally, about collecting war diaries and dreams, which started as a project with students. One of our colleagues, Bogdan, uh, Bogdan Shumilovich, whom I mentioned, was teaching a class uh, on visual uh, studies and there were a group of students. And what do you do? And how you proceed with studying with class? And that was like, this is this, his decision. And uh, discussion together that he would proceed with working with students on their diaries and later recalling dreams and focusing on the outside. And this is, was something that lasted for almost three months and produced a collection from which we hope to expand into conversation what is a good document and especially when we think about dreams and how we uh, catch this moment and give voice also in space to emotions um which is uh hard and two final ones uh, oral testimonies and telegram archive which i will not speak because we will have um two presentation um people who are leading these projects are uh, my colleagues and i have a great honor of working with them you will hear natalia trishenko and teras nazaruk today anastasia holyapka always machanets 
working on visual documentation and Gordanshul knowledge on diaries and dreams in many partnerships enabled this work. So thank you very much. And I'm looking forward to our conversation today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sophia. That was uh, that was a wonderful introduction to the center and what you've been doing uh, since this uh, particular phase of the war began. Um, and so what I would like to do now, uh, as you mentioned, I'm going to um, go ahead and introduce our next speaker, which is Dr. Natalia Atrishenko, who is a research fellow at the Center for Urban History in Lviv, as you said. Uh, she is also an associate researcher at the Center for Contemporary History in Potsdam. Dr. Atrishenko holds a PhD in sociology from the Institute of Sociology at the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. Uh, and since uh, March 2022, she has led the Ukrainian team with the 24 to 22 5 a.m. International Documentation Initiative. Um, and also this fall, uh, Dr. Atrishenko is a Fulbright visiting scholar at Columbia University. Uh, Dr. Atrishenko, I turn the floor over to you. Yeah. Um, uh, thank you, Stephen, and thank you all wonderful team which makes possible this seminar series and the whole discussion about the uh, war in Ukraine and how it is historically situated and what could be possible outcomes of this huge conflict uh, in Europe, um, which none of us can actually foresee, even though uh, all of us uh, are more or less informed about different historical developments in the region, but still uh, the morning of February 24th was uh, a big shock for all of us uh, and to all larger communities. So thank you for having this opportunity and thank you for having us uh, at this event. And uh, mm, uh, Sophia situated our work really, really well, describing the way uh, how certain things are possible uh, under extreme circumstances and how the um, institutional framework and all the practices on which we build on uh, during this wartime and all the human capacities, all the institutional capacities, all the infrastructures and collaborations which were established by the center before and uh, which were mobilized uh, uh, after the full scale invasion. Uh, it's all become possible and it all led to this event and this discussion that we have today that we can actually talk about the things that were done at the Center for Urban History uh, since February 2022. Uh, war means a certain collapse of a timeline. Uh, at some point of time, you are in the overwhelming present. Uh, your past is challenged. Uh, you have to review everything that you've done and everything seems so meaningful. Everything seems so small compared to this uh, large scale destruction that happens all around you. And also about the future. You have no idea what will come next. You will no idea where the rocket will strike. You will no idea how far the front line will develop. And it all makes you trapped in this present. And as Sophia mentioned, thinking beyond this present and all the possibility that we had to reevaluate our previous experience, to reclaim back our institutional past and our professional biographies, and to think how we can mobilize professionally in order to um, react to the war, uh, not only as human beings, because for sure the first reaction was to uh, secure our lives, the lives of our own loved ones, and also help people around us, because war is a huge humanitarian disaster. Uh, it means millions of people uh, who are on move. It means uh, lots of deaths. It means uh, a threatened uh, professional identities, threatened family identities, uh, friends and family relations, and different connections that constitute our life. They are threatened by the war. And therefore, the first reaction is to help people, to help them find a shelter, to help them uh, with food, uh, and overall securing them as much as possible. And therefore, our institution turned into shelter. And being in the midst of this uh, uh, human flow and listening to the stories that people so willingly shared with us, we understood that somehow we are living through the moment which we have to document, 
and it is about our professional selves and our skills as historians, as sociologists, and as cultural anthropologists to have this intuition, professional one. And I do believe that it is part of our uh, education. And therefore, these courses are so important because they help us, they help us to train our professional intuition uh, in order to understand that something important is going on and we have to react. And therefore, we reacted. And this discussion that happened in the center, they resulted in this numerous initiative that Sophia just uh, described. And we have a possibility to build on the experience of so-called emergency archiving that happened at the center uh, even before. Uh, you had a meeting with Marcy Shore and discussed the events of Euromaidan uh, and the revolution of dignity in a quite a detail. One of our professional reactions at the center was to document uh, the Euromaidan and talk to people and record their stories, the stories of protesters on the streets of Lviv, Kyiv and Kharkiv back in December uh, 2013 and in February uh, 2014. So actually we had collected those sources, the stories of people who were in the midst of an event which was so open-ended. No one knew uh, back then uh, how the situation will develop. And I do remember the experience of January 16th, so-called dictatorship laws, which were adopted. And at some point of time, um, every one of us was seen as criminal. And all of our activities were actually semi-criminal. And we have a database of people who were on the streets. Uh, so at some point of time, all the ethical discussions that we have about the data protection, about privacy of people, and about our responsibility as scholars uh, towards different communities, but first and foremost towards the people with whom we engage into this conversation, it became extremely visible. And I recalled all of these feelings back in February uh, 2022, because it led to the certain responsibility that we have. And in my short talk, I would like to briefly touch upon just several issues because the, uh, this initiative is so multi-layered and it has so many different topics which we can discuss during Q&A. But I would like to talk explicitly about the risk assessment under this type of initiatives and also briefly touch upon the consequences uh, that this type of documentation might have on the knowledge production and on the dynamics of academia and the way how Ukrainian voices uh, in different level, Ukrainian voices as people who experience events and voices of Ukrainian scholars could be more visible in the discussion about contemporary war. Uh, speaking about the risk assessment, uh, when you start doing things, first you have to acknowledge really clearly what you can do and what you, what you cannot do. Setting up the boundaries and the limits of possible is crucial. We know that we are historians, we are sociologists, we are people from the humanities and social science, and we are not psychologists. We cannot uh, like heal people. We do not have toolbox in order to work with such a complex emotions that the war um, effect on people. Uh, we are not lawyers. And the documentation of war crimes is a specific sphere which has its own rules and tools in order to document the voices, in order to make them um, a claim during the tribunal or during the law case. Uh, but at the same time, we can create sources. We can preserve the stories in order to understand the moment of present in the future. And therefore, it's also claiming back your timeline. It's not only about reclaiming your past and previous selves, but it also a certain entering into the future. It's a possibility for you to dream about Ukraine, where these sources, these stories could be part of the larger narration about these events. And they will help us to avoid oversimplification. They will help us to see um, actually how uh, diverse ways of stories, how different ways of experience, because the story of the war, it's so easily trapped into one single narration. And having this complexity preserved is really important for historians and social scientists who will 
try to assess this moment in the future. Uh, so speaking about the possibilities of what we can do, we can create the sources. We can engage in conversation with people. And we had already a question in the chat from Natalia about the way how we select uh, research participants and how we um, uh, engage in the conversation itself. So it's also about risk assessment. Who can you engage in this uh, documentation initiative? Setting the boundaries where to record the stories. Should we record people in Kharkiv under the bombs and artillery shellings? Of course not, but someone might do that. Taking all the responsibilities and assessing the risk of a person being killed in the midst of your project. So setting up the limits and the possibilities where you can actually uh, engage in the documentation. Uh, somehow the choice for us was easy because we were in Lviv, we were inside the country affected by the war, but far from the front line. Still, there was a risk, and there is a risk, and today morning was a clear example of this type of risk of missile attack, which can happen anywhere in Ukraine. So does it mean that we have to suspend all types of activities that we do because there is such a risk, or we might decide where we can actually um, conduct those interviews um, when the risk is as low as possible? But at the same time, it's the risk that you accept. Uh, while you are doing this type of initiative within the country affected by the war. Uh, so we recorded interviews only uh, in Western part of Ukraine during the spring. And after Russian troops withdraw from uh, Kyiv region, we also conduct interviews in Kyiv. So it was also like the whole type of negotiation where you draw the line, whom you are going to include, and where is actually this risk higher, where it is lower, and how you can uh, situate yourself within these different uh, lines. And then we decided to uh, record stories of people who are internally displaced and volunteers, people whose professional life was suspended and who um, invested and mobilized uh, himself or herself into support and help of people in need. The main focus of conversation was everydayness. And it's also about risk, like uh, everydayness is such a topic which is so omnipresent and the war happened in our everydayness. Uh, it also has so many different extreme um, manifestations because war is about extreme violence. But at the same time, war about the lives which going on. And uh, this life was heavily altered, heavily changed uh, by uh, by the violence that happened, but at the same time, people do adapt and people do continue living. And therefore we tried to create the space, which is so wide for a person to trace his or her story in the as safe way as possible. We don't want to uh, push people into uh, the space which could create really, really intense emotions. Uh, the word trauma is so omnipresent in the discussion, which is used and misused by scholars. But still, there are so many difficult and intense emotions that people uh, do experience. And some of them might be called trauma, uh, unfolding trauma, trauma which is still ongoing. And therefore, engaging in conversation, meaning uh, acknowledging of this possible um, emotional landscape into which you are stepping in. Uh, therefore, we use the idea of talking about everydayness as a wide space where a person can trace his or her story in the safest way. And we shared the list of questions in advance. It's also part of my answer to Natalia. Uh, so people can prepare themselves. People can uh, find the best way how to narrate their stories. Uh, telling one story could be therapeutic. And I also had this experience of uh, people sharing their relief after the interview was over. And at the same time, they felt the contribution to something bigger as an important part of the motivation of sharing. Uh, people do experience themselves in the midst of a historic event. And it is something unique that uh, the event is already uh, labeled as historic. 
And people want their experiences to be preserved, to be documented, and to be part of this larger um, narration of Ukrainian community about the time of the war. Uh, risk assessment also means uh, uh, sensitivity towards emotions of the team, because people who conduct interviews could also be exposed to vicarious trauma, and therefore thinking about psychological support and uh, paying huge attention to uh, training of those people. Uh, there should the interviewers uh, should be experienced people. Uh, they have to be sensitive towards the topics which are, we are going to cover within conversation. So training and psychological support is important part of um, this risk assessment as well. And finally, last but not least, uh, risk assessment means security of the data. And when you are conducting those types of research in the midst of the war, you are collecting personal data. You are collecting information about uh, Ukrainian military somehow, because people do have relatives uh, who are in Ukrainian armed forces or in territorial defense. Uh, you can find information about people who are still under occupation. So you are collecting so much sensitive data. And uh, digital security is extremely important for this type of project. And we paid a lot of attention. And in order to develop uh, this type of um, documentation initiative, um, we created a network of institutions all together, uh, the center which started this uh, documentation with support of our friends and colleagues uh, in Poland, the Institute of Philosophy and Sociology, who also did interviews with Ukrainian refugees, uh, and also colleagues from the University of St. Andrews, who provided trainings for us. As I mentioned, it is really important to be prepared to the stories that you might receive as an interviewer. Uh, and also the Center for Contemporary and Digital History at the University of Luxembourg, uh, with whom we heavily discuss all these issues of digital security. So overall, we collected about 150 interviews. Uh, the sample is quite diverse. So diversity was one of the key um, selection criteria for us, but also in order to uh, recruit person for the interviewing, uh, we did very intense debriefing uh, and shared all the possible consequences of these interviews first being narrated in the moment and then being archived for the future. So we really tried to make the participation as informed as possible. We also shared some of our uncertainties because we have no idea how the situation will develop. We have no idea when these materials could be open for larger public. Uh, when and uh, what would be the procedure and at what places uh, the access would be open. Uh, we shared this uncertainty with uh, research participants, with our storytellers, uh, in order to make their participation informed. Uh, so 150 interviews, uh, both males and females, with average age of about 40 years, people um, the interviews only with adults, 18 years plus uh, to 74 years. So you have seen the range, which is also quite diverse. And we also try to collect stories from different regions. So people who came uh, not only from Kharkiv, for instance, or from Mariupol, but also from different uh, parts of Ukraine. We also search for different uh, trajectories uh, of internally displaced people trying to make it as diverse as possible, but at the same time, acknowledging all the possible limitations because uh, every project would be limited. And stating up these limits is part of us being honest and being transparent to different audiences. And I think it is important to say that as well. Uh, what this borderline experience tell us about uh, uh, the whole knowledge production? and the way how science operates. Uh, we know that there are certain normative uh, ideas of how the science should be done. Uh, you think about special timelines, about applications for grants, about the way how this application should be submitted, what kind of questions should be included there. Uh, 
And when you are in the war, when you are in the extremely um, uh, intense situation, uh, a lot of procedures collapsed. And one of my big lessons for that is the need of a community of peers with whom you can talk, with whom you can discuss. And what is part of the discussion with ethical committee that you might have in your institutions or different boards where you have to justify uh, your question. This community actually worked as uh, this type of um, committee for us because of this uh, bi-weekly meeting that we have and the whole discussions and thanks to Zoom uh, that we have the possibility to uh, engage in this type of discussion. Um, and thanks to Ukrainian communal workers because of whom we have electricity and internet connection. And it is possible to be part of this international discussion. So the importance of the team and importance of these connections, which actually constitute the core of science, communication with peers. And somehow through all the bureaucratic procedures, we started to forget what is science all about. It is about this communication. It is about this thought collective, uh, the term coined by another person who was born in Viv, Ludwig Fleck, who is uh, the pioneer of um, uh, sociology of science. We need the thought collectives. And during the war, during the midst of the war, it became extremely visible. The need of communication, the need of this type of support. And another big, um, big lesson from that is the visibility of Ukrainian voices. Uh, we all started this discussion that uh, we have to listen to Ukrainians on different levels. And the, one of the things that I am a bit afraid of that now we collected so many materials, we are actually overwhelmed with different types of documentation. As Sophia mentioned, it is one of the most documented wars so far that we have. And the big, challenge for us would be how to assess these materials and what kind of narratives uh, are we going to produce based on this type of sources? Uh, who is going to produce these narratives? And I'm really afraid that it would be part of this power imbalance when Ukrainians have collected so many sources and then we will have big names coming to the sources and proving that theory is being is the right or wrong. So, my big call would be about the inclusion of Ukrainian scholars, not only in the collection of data, but also in the production of theory because of other embedded experiences of this war, because emotions also could be an important commentary to the things that we are collecting. War is not only about the raw data, it's about human beings and human lives. And we as scholars are, also affected by the war. And I do believe that this experience is also valuable for academic discussion, not only uh, like discussion uh, during the coffee chat, but academic discussion. And I do believe that this, this experience can contribute uh, to knowledge production and to a better understanding of what Ukraine is and what Ukraine is going to be. Uh, thank you, I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalia. Um, now we're going to move on to our third speaker. And then after that, we will begin to uh, address some of the questions, many of the great questions that have already been pouring in uh, to the Q&A. Uh, our next speaker is Taras Nazaruk, who is the head of digital history projects at the Center um, for Urban History in Lviv. His background is in journalism and also media studies and communication design. He holds a BA from the University of Lviv in Ukraine, as well as a master's from the University of uh, Wroclaw in uh, Poland. Uh, since 2016, he has been working as a coordinator of Lviv Interactive, uh, which you can find on the website of um, the center. And this is a digital encyclopedia of the modern history of the city. Uh, during the full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine, he's been working on a telegram archive of the war. Taras, I turn the floor over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. 
And thank you for uh, inviting us uh, for this presentation. It's actually the great pleasure and honor uh, to to be here and to share our projects with uh, this uh, audience. And thank you for uh, making this event series possible. It's uh, it's really incredible uh, that what you have organized. I will try to share my screen right now. I hope you can see it. Okay, so. Um, so I'll be talking about Telegram Archive uh, of the war in Ukraine, which is a responsive initiative started uh, as an act of uh, professional and civilian resistance uh, to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And our intention was to capture an online fragment of our wartime reality with the aim of uh, creating a long-term historical uh, re record preserved for, the, for research in the future. And this effort tries to set the ground for talking about the war when it will be possible to talk about the war in the past tense. Uh, my colleague Natalia in the previous presentation uh, talked about storytellers and uh, stories that people um, shared in the conversa in conversations uh, for the archives. So I wonder what kind of stories could uh, could be told with Telegram archive of the war. It is still early to say comprehensively. Uh, the amount of data uh, is quite large, more than eight terabytes of posts, videos, photos, and files, and is constantly growing. Uh, the type of archival content is also really diverse. We have more than uh, 1,600 uh, of channels and chats in the archive. Although we try to collect it manually and make curatorial decisions on setting certain thematic collections or preparing descriptions uh, for each channel, we still do not know uh, what exactly we have in our archive. Its scale goes beyond what one can easily comprehend, and it should be studied more precisely. That's actually the way how communication looks like in social media. It is overwhelming. It is, to a large extent, chaotic. So we cannot fully understand the war through Telegram, but it is possible to explore how Telegram became part of it. In numerous reports and stories from occupied Mariupol, uh, people mentioned how crucial any source of information was to them during the fights in the city. It was and still is important, not just in Mariupol, but across the entire country. Uh, what counts a lot is information, no matter how distant from the front line you are. Uh, the experiences of people affected by this war are multiple and different. Each story is unique. Uh, but what uh, I would argue was and still remains a common pattern is a need for information. In a situation of threat and emergency, people really try to understand what is happening by constantly searching for information about their neighborhood, town or region. I'm not sure if it's really helpful. The information flows are oversaturated and yet fragmented, full of misinformation or disinformation, uh, often strictly regulated by officials and often purely checked or analyzed. But people go there and check updates any, uh, anyway. If not the stories that one can tell out of the Telegram archive already, uh, one can see what questions people ask on Telegram and what information they are looking for. I will try to present some of the questions that I was able to notice in our archive together with my uh, colleagues. But let me bring uh, a short context uh, of what Telegram is. It is a social media and uh, instant messaging platform that become ra rapidly popular in the first days of the Russian invasion. From the very beginning, there was an understanding that it would become the main source of information for thousands of people, and the audience would be as diverse as the country is. First, it was visible from the number of uh, downloads, then a sociological surveys proved it. In many countries, Telegram is not popular at all. In some countries, only small marginalized groups use it. But in Ukraine, this context is much broader, covering a wide spectrum of topics. Uh, in the first two months of the war, 76.6% of Ukrainians turned to social media for news. And Telegram was the most popular of them, 65.7%, as you can see on this char chart. Um, and this is the survey as of May 2022. Uh, so Telegram is the most popular social media, but of course not the only one. 
uh, there are others and uh, each one has its own specificity for instance twitter is used uh, mostly for english speaking communication for certain professional or academic circles so it also affects what kind of information you can find there Additionally, the Telegram platform is quite liberal in terms of posting and exporting content, so it is relatively easy to download entire chats and channels for given time range uh, without previous special technical training or background in social media archiving. I tried to uh, specify our archiving approach in the essay for a sociological journal, which was shared as a reading material for this event, so I won't uh, go uh, into details about that. Uh, so what questions about the war do people have while using Telegram in Ukraine? As mentioned before, uh, access to information is absolutely crucial, especially in the towns on the front line where it directly affects people's safety. For such Telegram chats, you can, from such Telegram chats, you can find out more about areas where fighting is happening where the artillery fires, what are the military or heavy equipment positions, what is, where is the main battlefield, and so on. It allows people to at least roughly assess the level of risk for themselves. In this chat from the Sichansk area, for instance, people ask each other what is the current situation around them on the night of March 7th. Someone replies, all is quiet, trying to sleep. Let's stay in touch, and then they wish everyone calm night. This is the conversation from a relatively calm moment, uh, but for instance this update was shared uh, on October 29th from the Snihurivka area, uh, where so-called eyes, so basically witnesses, reported about the attack on the Russian military position near some tomatoes farm, whatever it means, but this is the information that is mostly relevant for locals. There are multiple channels tracking missile attacks across the entire country. There are reports about drones or missiles launched their uh, directions or interceptions or hits. These are the updates on the screenshot about the massive attack on power infrastructure from the early morning today. Reportedly over 50 uh, rockets were launched and 44 were intercepted and some were intercepted about the Lviv reach. But some still hit infrastructure mostly in uh, in central Ukraine. Russia's airstrikes and missile launches uh, are regularly accompanied by telegram messages. Such messages are often uh, disseminated to compete in speed with missiles. For instance, there is a local telegram channel in Mykolaiv, a town in uh, the country's south. Uh, Russian armed forces failed in taking the city, so the front line more or less stabilized a couple of dozen kilometers south of it. It's been heavily bombarded since then. Uh, most of the strikes are launched from the occupied Kherson and the city further to the south. The distance between Kherson and Mykolaiv is uh, 60 kilometers with the front line between them. Uh, so when rockets are seen over Kherson, aiming at Mykolaiv, as you can see it on the map, Kherson and Mykolaiv, uh, Herson residents have some time uh, to inform subscribers of the Mykolaiv channel about spotted rockets. Sometimes this information comes faster than an official rate alert. <clears throat> Many survivors from the occupied Mariupol say that uh, their decisions on evacuation were largely based on their access to information. So this kind of news and updates were crucial for their safety. Uh, that's why people ask about evacuation routes and checkpoints status. Uh, uh, there, are, there are various channels where people share their experiences on how they were trying to evacuate from the fight area or occupy territories. There is this channel with the title roughly translated as how was your trip. People post there on an everyday basis uh, their experiences and tips on how they managed or didn't manage to evacuate. Evacuation and crossing the front line could often last many hours and days, waiting in long lines or passing numerous checkpoints. Every day the situation could be different. It is both dangerous and unpredictable. So again, people go to such chats asking for advice or seeking the experiences of others. 
This is, for instance, a short update from Kherson Bereslav direction on May 14th. No one was allowed to go through after passing Bereslav. So basically, this updates allows you to understand what is the situation on checkpoints at a given moment. Uh, at, at the same time, there are those offering help with evacuation, offering their cars to cross checkpoints, help to get official permissions, etc. Being afraid of the potential risk of scams or fraud, people try to check such offers in special chats where previous fraud experiences are documented and collected. So they go to there to double check if a certain person is trustworthy and wasn't involved in fraud previously. After evacuation to safer places, people ask for residence and help upon arrival. Uh, local chats for rental uh, are full of messages from those uh, searching for a place to stay. Such messages are often accompanied by further uncertainty. For instance, there is this uh, message on the screen from one of the leave chats uh, where a person on March 15th uh, uh, searching for a, for a place to stay for the residents uh, and uh, saying that there is no point of uh, saying I'm looking for a place for a long time because no one really knows for how long and what future brings. One month for sure, but I hope to get back home to my close ones and family. In some cases, uh, people evacuate in such a desperate situation that they simply need someone to help even get off the train. For instance, this woman on March 1st uh, was asking someone to help her daughter with newborn triplets get off the train arriving in Lviv. She herself stayed in Kiev to look after her animal shelter that she couldn't leave behind. Needless to say, how, how many similar questions were posted in, in such groups. Upon arrival, people start establishing uh, or searching for new communities for internally displaced people. Uh, there are chats almost in any city where people ask for advice on how to settle on a new place, how to register themselves as IDP or uh, for social security payments, or where to find a job or join volunteering initiatives and so on. And this is the message from Lubne, from town of Lubne. From a person asking how to register as an internal uh, displaced person, but the nickname of this person uh, is uh, translated as I want back home to my home. So basically, the nickname is the opposite to the question that person is trying to find out. In Ujorod, for instance, internally displaced persons created a group specifically for IDP moms uh, so that to unite women with similar experiences and ask each other practical advices for raising children in a new place. Where to find a certain store or activity, how to get medical and mental services, exchange clothes or any other kind of help. From the first days of the full-scale invasion, people ask about their close ones after they went missing. There are local and nationwide chats where people post photos and personal details about those missing. Sometimes there are also details of what happened, like lost connection while he or she was trying to evacuate or lost connection after shelling and so on. In some chats, people ask for animal rescue. Many animals were left behind or went missing during the warfare or evacuation. Uh, so in such chats, people try to check whether a dog or cat is still at their homes, or they also try to ask if someone recognizes this or that pet that the they would find on the street. These are the screenshots from Irpini area north of Kiev. Notorious attacks on the oil storages and refineries in spring caused rapid petroleum shortages. Until the situation stabilized after a few months, people created chats asking where one can find gasoline, uh, what stations work, and how long you need to wait in a line, and, and so on. The same it works with the medical and food supply shortages. Uh, 
in the most endangered towns where logistics are disrupted. So in order to buy food or medicine, you need to follow chats with this kind of information. This is the screenshot from the Mikolai channel where people share updates about water sources as the water supply was destroyed by Russians. People experience difficulties in coping uh, with distress and ask for psychological help or someone to talk with. There are chats for such requests as well. Usually such chats are created by a group of professionals uh, volunteering to answer such emergency requests from random people. Nearly all Telegram channels are full today of crowdfunding campaigns to raise money for various purposes, from medical help for civilians to vehicles or equipment for military, usually cars or drones. This is an example of a report from a military unit while they were bringing to the front line a vehicle which was bought during such a crowdfunding campaign. And finally, once People are more or less settled in new safer places. They ask about their homes, which they had to abandon upon evacuation and have no information since. They try to find out what happened to their homes and if everything is fine there. Here's the post from October 23 about a certain address in the occupied Severodonetsk. The last apartment in the entryway. There is unverified information that the roof above the apartment is damaged. It is necessary to clarify this information in more detail. And this one is the post from uh, about the occupied Mariupol from October 29th with another request to, checks, uh, to check one's home. Uh, stay safe, guys. All will be well. Please visit the avenue of Victory 101 on the left bank. Please, I beg you. So, uh, you can see how Telegram is used across the entire country in the context of the current war. It is only one among many perspectives on what is possible to find in this archive. The spectrum is much broader, so I can just give you a general understanding of what kind of data we collect according to these categories, and it is still tentative, but we try to have it as diverse as possible from official news channels, infrastructure, or volunteer chats to IT community databases or personal blogs, military blogs, open source intelligence, information on ecology and animal rescue, about refugees, local and urban chats structured court, uh, according to administrative regions, humor, irony, economy, law, food, gastronomy, war and gender, border crossings, occupied territories, uh, Russian propaganda, Russian bordering regions, different kind of topics that are uh, that we try to collect. All the posts that we archive are publicly available on Telegram, so we do not collect anything from private chats. At the same time, the data that we collect is full of personal and sensitive information. Users still systematically or occasionally reveal various pieces of personal information like names, phone numbers, card numbers, etc. Given the circumstances of war, photos of dead bodies, human remains, and evidence of atrocities and destruction are omnipresent in most of the chats we archive. We consider this archival data an important so as an important source of information, so we want to preserve it from deletion by creating an archival setting as channels disappear and the nature of social media messages is quite fragile, especially in circumstances of war. Some telegram data already are most likely available only in our archive. But we still have a lot of concerns about access to this archive. That's why we do not yet make it public. In our further plans for the data, we try to align it with two guiding principles for setting archival access. First principle is it may potentially cause harm if access is not provided carefully. And the other principle is it is unethical to limit access unnecessarily. So the archive is not available until we create an access infrastructure that allows to reveal the data for researchers upon registration and accepting certain terms of use. It still might be nuanced depending on the topic and content sensitivity. So some parts of it might be unavailable for the long term. Eventually, we hope this will be a historical archive. As I already mentioned in the beginning, uh, we might not be able to understand what is happening in this war using Telegram only, but it is possible to explore with this archive how Telegram became part of it.
so I would stop here and uh, thank you thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions during the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Taras, and, and to Natalia and Sophia as well. And so now um, we're going to go ahead and transition to the Q&A. We've gotten uh, so many great questions so far. And I just wanted to sort of lead off with one, which actually draws from a couple of um, comments that I've seen um, through the Q&A and also sort of um, adding my own part to this question. Um, Based upon your research uh, so far and all these different ways of documenting um, the war, what would you say would, I mean, just drawing from what you've actually sort of found as you're documenting um, the war, what would you say to audiences, let's say like in the United States or elsewhere in Europe um, or elsewhere in the world that are following the war, either academics or the broader audience, what, do you, what would you say based upon your evidence are some of the misconceptions um, that those of us who are observing the war from outside, um, both again, the broader public, but also, and this is actually addressing one of the points that Natalia uh, was making about sort of the, the problem of, you know, sort of researchers from without coming in and sort of uh, creating like a narrative based upon um, your findings. So just to kind of recap what I'm trying to ask here, which is based upon what you found so far, what would you say would be some some misconceptions um, that uh, outside observers have about the war that perhaps this information could help um, could help them with? Uh, I might start with very, sure. very general observation that we are all trapped in teleology. And it is very easy to describe the events from the current point of view and saying that the war was inevitable and it all led to the war. Uh, but I do remember from the interviews that we collected how, how shocked everyone was and how everyone was trapped in the idea like no one expected that the, the war like that on such a scale or such a bar barbaric scale uh, could happen. So. I think other materials could really help us uh, to escape, or if not escape, but at least uh, uh, see this trap of teleology and uh, see how, um, how difficult and diverse the situation was. And uh, for that reason, at least our interviews and the way that we started to collect them in mid-March uh, could really help us to see this diversity of reaction and, um, well, be more informed, at least, uh, about this challenge. Okay. Uh, Taras or Sophia, would you like to also address this question? And you don't have to, like, if you don't want to, but... Um, yeah, go ahead, Sophia. I don't know, it's probably, I, I wanted to, if Taras could um, speak from the experience of reading uh, the channels, because I don't have that you know, firsthand experience, but I think that it's both people from outside of Ukraine, but also people inside Ukraine, um, you know, they're surprised by many things. And I think that one of the things that we are surprised is actually that, however problematic, there are institutions and infrastructure functioning in the country. Uh, and I think that uh, this is really what kind of um, um, is addressing this conception that Ukraine is a failed state, which is a part of, uh, and I think in terms of you know, both state working, and uh, in the question that also society working. And I think that this is also something that is for external audience, but also for us internally is critically uh, important. Okay. Yes, I have, I have also some comments on that, but uh, suddenly I have some troubles with the connection. So I hope you can, you can still hear me. Yep. Uh, uh, because there were some interceptions. Uh, I actually I have very practical comment to that because uh, uh, what I was able to notice that uh, 
uh, the very practical issue of language barrier uh, complicates things. So uh, the Telegram itself uh, has a huge amount of data. And now we try to organize a workshop, uh, just the data sprint in order to dig deeper into details and understand how we can work with that. And inviting uh, scholars uh, to, to the data sprint means that we need to find people who understand and read Russian and Ukrainian uh, languages to the extent so that uh, it is possible to understand even some nuances between Ukrainian and Russian languages. I had uh, one comment from my colleague Karina Lazaruk, who took part in certain uh, data sprints on Telegram previously at the University of Amsterdam, and she mentioned that there was a problem that uh, for certain like expressions, uh, figures of speech that uh, people use in Ukraine, in Ukrainian language, that are not that clear to uh, people who didn't know that language. So basically, the very practical thing of knowing the language, knowing the local context, is a huge, uh, uh, yeah, huge insight uh, allows uh, that, that allows to uh, to work on analyzing and researching this data. Great. Um, I was going to go on to a couple. Other questions, unless uh, Stephen, unless you wanted to uh, ask a question as well. No, you're good. Uh, so this was another uh, question that came through the Q and A as well, which was: um, Are there other uh, Ukrainian organizations uh, elsewhere in the country that are doing somewhat similar work to you, and are you able to to coordinate uh, both your research, your your findings, your data collection, etc.? <clears throat> Sophia, you want to take I that? think you know I'm just I, I think that Natalia could speak about uh, testimonies and oral history and uh, on digital that would make sense but yes there are many yeah that's yeah yeah yes it's a very short <laughs> and general answer even more there are numerous initiatives uh, which are documenting war in Ukraine now um some of them are focused on uh, oral testimonies. Some of them are focused on war documentation. And I've seen in this Q&A chat something about the toolbox, like the specific way how the war crime should be documented in order to uh, be part of the uh, tribunal. Yes, it is a specific way to have you actually collect the data uh, in order it to be considered for the tribunal. The specific way have you trace it. Um, and there are numerous initiatives uh, which are documenting the war uh, in terms of oral testimonies, in terms of also uh, different type of uh, digital traces, which we leave uh, some of the documentation of um, uh, destroyed heritage, for instance. Uh, there are institutions which are specifically targeted into documenting the damage that happened to Ukrainian heritage uh, uh, preservation and uh, the monuments which were destroyed, the facilities that were destroyed by the war. So if you look at different uh, sectors, you will find the numerous attempts uh, which are uh, aiming into documentation and some of them are coordinated. But, you know, at the very beginning, there are like uh, the idea that you have to do something and then the coordination it implies another level of work uh, which has to be done. And I'm sure its stage will come next. Uh, and probably the state will also interfere at that level. And I know that the Ministry of Culture, they try to engage at least uh, in documenting the war. Uh, yeah, but the, there are attempts uh, to start communication and we really engage into sharing our methodology. So, uh, on the level of metadata, it would be extremely difficult to create a, the, uh, like for instance, one big archive of everything, uh, but at least having some uh, platform where you can trace different initiatives, for instance, in different regions or focused on different topics. I think that platform is something that is definitely needed. Mm -hmm. I can just add to what Natalia just said that there are numerous initiatives uh, in in Ukraine and internationally uh, collecting different kind of documentation about the war and also uh, well in this rather digital archiving area as well uh, there are plenty of them and uh, uh, that is true that it is difficult to like, 
create a certain platform, how to coordinate them uh, all together, or how to create a one universal archive of everything. But uh, at least here, the center, what we try to do is to set a platform uh, where we at least can have a conversation and meet and learn about each other. So we have actually uh, right now we have this uh, event series called uh, Digital History Seminars on Emergency Archiving, where we invite uh, other archiving initiatives to present what they have done. And uh, it is really interesting to learn about different methodologies, different motivations of creating such uh, uh, archiving initiatives, because uh, in each initiative has their own uh, peculiarity, their own motivation. For instance, there is this uh, archive uh, called DocuDays War Archive, which is it was created by a, a film festival about human rights uh, in Ukraine called DocuDays, and they, uh, since the beginning of the full-scale invasion, they created a, a video archive of uh, uh, testimonies on war crimes, uh, human rights violations, and they have this very specific focus on uh, uh, collecting testimonies that could serve as a uh, evidence of uh, war crimes or human rights violation for the trials. There are also ex international initiatives like Saving Ukrainian Cultural Heritage Online that you might know uh, it is initiated uh, in the United States, but uh, as it was a horizontal initiative, it uh, various volunteers across the, the whole world joined to, to archive uh, websites of different kind of cultural institutions in Ukraine, libraries, museums, archives, and so on. So um, initiatives are numerous. And uh, the, the, main, the, impo the most important thing about those initiatives is that everyone has a, their own motivation or specificity, and that makes those uh, initiatives very, really diverse. And uh, it brings more perspectives on the way uh, uh, the events in Ukraine at the moment are looking at. Great. And just to kind of um, uh, add to that question, actually, uh, this is somewhat related, which is thinking about the future. So we've been primarily talking about um, how the ways that you're documenting the war is going to be useful for for researchers, for Ukrainians, um, potentially for some sort of war crimes um, tribunal. But on the level of methodology. There's a question that came up here um, uh, from one of uh, Steve's students that I wanted to read and adapt. Um, the question was, when you are documenting the war in Ukraine, are there specific techniques that you would like future scholars to follow as precedent to ensure the validity of the information reported to the public? And if I can broaden the question like a little bit, what are sort of the lessons learned the lessons that you've learned on a methodological level that you would hope that your project, your center is actually able um, to share with other scholars who in the future may be um, having to draw upon uh, similar methodology for other uh, conflicts. I think the basic tensions that we have is between do no harm which is uh, crucial for any social science or project which engage other uh, human beings uh, into different types of interaction. And at the same time, we have a pressure for being, um, uh, well, uh, following academic compliance, I might put it like that. And uh, also another type of pressure that we have, like uh, stepping into the public and doing something not only for the sake of academia, but also for the larger community. So this three types of pressure that uh, we faced during the uh, launch of the project and throughout its realization. Uh, now, all the time you have to navigate between the way how far you might go in terms of not harming people. And I, I briefly discussed this risk assessment and all these ideas of um, and being, co being conscious about possible consequences that your work might have on the lives of uh, people with whom you are conducting interviews, but also their communities and of the larger academic community. So still for us, it was really important to have well-trained uh, interviewers uh, who are really aware to the methodology and who really uh, can trace signs of dissociation, for instance, when a person during the interview becomes de dissociated. Uh, and what could be different reactions to uh, different emotions that people might experience during the interview itself? So uh, 
good uh, preparation is extremely important. And it could be my advice, but I'm not in the position of advising anyone. I'm in the position of sharing. Uh, and based on our experience, like good preparation is very important. And acknowledging possible consequences is also very important. Uh, sharing your uncertainty is also important because we don't know uh, how much can be promised to those people uh, with whom we are conducting interviews. Uh, uh, when we ourselves have no idea how uh, the access will work in the future. Um, so uh, also one of the big, big uh, lessons for us is giving as much control as possible to other storytellers. And I'm speaking now about this uh, oral history documentation because war is about removing other agency and Russian invasions really influence on the way how we can control our lives. Uh, and if we cannot control our lives, we have to be able to control our stories about our lives. And also thinking about possibilities, how we can uh, share our authority with our storytellers and make them aware of the possibilities how the stories could be used in the future. And for me, the very ideal of this type of scholarship is actually community scholarship. When we not only conduct interviews with people, when we also engage them into the discussion about the stories that we as scholars, as academics, as people with more power and with more authority um, can actually invite them into this discussion and listen to their voices, not only as sources, as we might label, but also as humans who did experience this war and who also can share with us a lot and from whom we can also learn a lot. Thank you, Natalia. Sophia uh, and Taras, would you like to uh, share some insights on that question? Uh, yes, I have, I have some comments on that from uh, our experience of archiving Telegram. Uh, which is also a quite fresh experience for us because before the, the full-scale invasion, we didn't have any previous training or background in social media or web archiving, so it was really new thing for us. And one of the first uh, uh, kind of insights that I can uh, tell out of it is the emergency archiving requires just immediate action. You just need to start collecting data if it's social media or or uh, or web uh, online websites because it's really ephemeral and it uh, disappears at any moment and in case of emergency situations it's uh, basically the crucial uh, thing to to start collecting it and then i learned from other web archiving initiatives that there is even this principle uh, i just learned about uh, about that afterward that there's this principle archive first and ask questions later uh, which uh, basically uh, was the principle that we applied at the beginning because we didn't know how to do that. We just started collecting that and asking other people who are more trained and experienced in web archiving or social media archiving how to do that. And then I've learned some basic principles from that. And uh, I can see another two things that uh, I think it is important to address when it comes to social media archiving uh first thing is public versus uh, private and public uh in i mean published on social media and archived in uh in certain archival setting because uh there is also this commonly used principle uh when it when something is posted online on social media then web archivists usually consider it as accessible and public and then they i mean everyone can just access it and then it is possible to collect it but i i don't think uh, i mean uh, so, that something that is public uh, is uh, equal to something that is archived and stored in a certain uh, archival setting because people might be aware that they uh, publish something online and it is accessible to everyone but they might not be aware that someone would uh, uh, would like to collect it into archival setting and someone want to start store it into certain archive and uh, preserve it for the I mean for the long term. So people don't usually aware that uh, social media posts, messages, everything that they post online uh, could be archived, not only could be visible to anyone, but could be archived for the long term. And I think that uh, it is not, uh, I mean, there is no that much of this discussion uh, in the circles of uh, social media or web archivists. I mean, everyone concerns, uh, considers by default everything that is public, worthwhile to be archived. 
but at the same time, I think it should be discussed somehow. And in our uh, archive, we do not have the exact question how to deal with that. But I think that we might want to uh, reach out to every administrator of, of the channel uh, or chat that we have collected, informing them that this archive was created and informing them about the uh, possibility to withdraw the materials mm -hmm. that uh, they created or that somehow affect them uh, from the archive anytime in the future so that they are aware about that. And the third point about uh, those insight that I want to, to mention as well is uh, curatorial and automatized uh, archiving uh, initiatives because uh, archive, web archiving and social media archiving is largely dependent on a different kind of algorithm and automatized techniques, how to store large amounts of data, huge amounts of data actually. And there are even telegram archives on this war uh, considerably larger than ours. But at the same time, uh, it is difficult to navigate through uh, this huge amount of data if there is no any curatorial decision on what to archive, how to collect it, how to categorize the material, how to uh, access specific topics or uh, or channels in the in the in the archive. So that's why our decision on manual archiving. So there is the group of four archivists doing this archive and collecting this data. On one hand, it slows down, so we cannot collect all the all the materials or entire telegram about the war. So we have you know, considerably less amount of data than it could be. But at the same time, we really know more of uh, the data that we archived and what kind of topics we have in our archive. And we can put it in, into certain categories. We can advise researchers what uh, could be find where and how to deal with specific data and so on. So we know our deep, our archive deeper than it is. It could be learned if it's automatized. Great, thank you so much um, for those insights, Steve. How are we doing um, on time? So, and would you so like? We to are we are pretty much out of time. Um, I know we could keep uh, this incredible group of people here um, for hours, but I also know it's uh, very late in Lviv already. Um, Sophia, I, I didn't know uh, you didn't get a chance there at the end. If there was uh, any last thing that you would like to share, um, that would be uh, fantastic. Um, everything that you guys are doing is um, just utterly incredible. Um, every question that I have feels incredibly premature. Uh, and I realize very much, I think, the extent to which I'm a historian uh, and I'm used to looking back and I keep thinking about questions of, of how somebody's going to use these materials someday, but that question feels incredibly premature right now. Um, but just, uh, you know, a thank you for what you're doing. And, and Sophia, I wanted to let you have a chance. Um, just to conclude, I think, you know, this is, this is, a, I mean, this is a life changing experience we are living through individually and as a society. And also, I think it is something that is not limited to boundaries and borders of Ukraine. I think this is also a moment when we ask questions on who are we as human being and how we uh, and how we live together in a decent way, uh, not only among us humans, but um, in all the complexity of uh, of the world, which is constituted by non-humans. And I think that this is really um, like to the question you ask, what we learned. Uh, from this documentation for the future methodology. I think that my hope is that we won't have to use the methodology in the context of war, so that we learn from war in order not to have war. Uh, and but on the other, ha other hand, this very uh, radical experience has, um, you know, it's, it's a moment of reckoning and a moment of, uh, you know, think asking these big questions of how to live on and how to live in a better way. And it just uh, goes across all of our activities, professional and personal. And um, there will be many conversations going and we do hope that some of the work we are doing and work you are doing uh, we'll have continuation in this new and slightly better future. Thank you so much for seeing Thank you so much, uh, Sophia, for those final words. Um, Steve? Yeah, Steve, thank you, uh, first off, um, for putting this together. Um, this 
the, the, the humanity, I think, of everything that we've been talking about today just comes through over and over again. Um, Taras has a paper that's already been published uh, on the work that he's doing on Telegram archiving. I have shared that through my Twitter. You can take a look there and find a link to it. Natalia has a, a paper in progress um, that she's writing about her work. I'll certainly share that as soon as it's uh, publicly available. Uh, some of my students have been fortunate enough to read that already. Um, thank you, uh, Taras, Natalia, Sophia, uh, for everything that you're doing. Um, we we will think about you all a lot uh, uh, going forward. We hope that this war comes to an end uh, soon and quickly and victoriously for Ukraine. Um, for everybody else, uh, I do want to invite you back again next week. Um, a number of people asked questions about um, war crimes, uh, and that's a topic that we're going to address directly next week. We have Francine Hirsch coming from the University of Wisconsin. Francine has written a book on uh, the Soviet participation in Nuremberg, uh, and she's going to talk about the lessons to be drawn from Nuremberg and why we must hold Putin accountable for waging a war of aggression. So we'll do that next Monday at 3 p.m. Uh, and uh, otherwise, I just really wish everybody all the best. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you.